Okay, good afternoon, everyone. So I'm Paige Mosley, solicitor to this planning committee. Um, it is the first... Oh, someone's still in? Have we got an echo now? Oh, there we go. Okay, so as I said, the first planning committee of the council year and the first item on the agenda is the appointment of the chair. So can I take nominations, please? The chairman. Yes, more. Uh, Councillor Phil Murphy. Okay, so Councillor Phil Murphy has been put forward by Councillor Powell. Can I have that seconded? Seconded. Yeah, okay. okay, seconded by Anne Webb. Are there any other nominations for chair? No? Okay, so if I can welcome up Councillor Murphy again. Thank you, Paige, and thank you, everybody. We'll, uh, we've had a slight delay because of technical problems, so we'll uh, get on as quickly as we can. Um, Right, um, so this is the planning committee for uh, the 6th of June. Um, I'm Councillor Phil Murphy and uh, the vice chair is uh, due to be uh, voted in. So can I propose uh, Councillor Dale Rook and can I, can I have a second for that? Councillor Maureen. Yes. Um, are there any others, Chair? Uh, thank you very much, Chair. Uh, very happy to uh, to be joining you uh, again. Thank you. Right, if I can just bear with me two secs while I get the agenda up. Uh, do we have any apologies for uh, absence, Richard? Uh, yes, Chair. Apologies from Councillors McConnell, Callard and Riley. Are there any to themselves? Please uh, start with you, Mark. Afternoon, committee. My name is Mark Hand. I'm head of service for uh, placemaking and regeneration, highways and flooding. Thank you, Chair. My name is Philip Thomas. I'm Development Services Manager with the Council. Good afternoon. I'm Amy Longford, Heritage and Applications Area Team Manager. Good afternoon. Mark Davis, Highway Development Manager. Paige Mosley, solicitor to this planning committee. Uh, Richard Williams, Democratic Services. Thank you very much. And can I remind everybody, please, uh, who are uh, attending online, to uh, keep your cameras on, otherwise you won't be able to vote. And can you put your hands up in the chat, please, so that uh, I don't have to look all over the screens for uh, whoever wants to, to speak. Um, We'll go then to the um, minutes of the previous uh, meeting. Uh, has anybody got any points to raise on those meetings? If not, next item is the applications themselves. Um, the first one is uh, application DM2021-00528 is the proposed residential development of two detached dwellings with private on-site parking uh, at, the, at Hollybush, Vinegar Hill and the Monmouthshire. Um, this is going to be uh, presented um, by uh, Amy Longford. So uh, Amy, would you like to uh, come in on that? Thank you very much, Chair. Yes, this application is before planning committee today due to a number of unresolved objections received and at the request of the former local member. So I hope you can all see the presentation there. The site is located to the southern part of Vinegar Hill in Undy and is currently occupied by two properties, Hollybush and Delfrin, built on the land that was formerly a quarry. Hollybush is within the blue area, as you can see on the slide, and Delfrin is to the immediate north of this, just outside the red line boundary. The site before members today is within the red line area. To the north, there is a modern estate named Hunch to the east, an area of public open space, and to the south and west are a number of larger individual properties, all accessed off Vinegar Hill. Hollybush and Delfrin have separate vehicular access off Vinegar Hill. 
The application seeks planning permission for two dwellings, the land east of Delfrin, accessed via the ex existing access to the property Delfrin. The proposed dwellings are both four bedrooms with garages. Plot one is proposed to have a detached garage to the northeast, and plot two, an attached garage to the east side of the gable of the property. Both dwellings will have three parking spaces, meeting the required standards. The site is within the development boundary of MEGA, and so the principle of new build residential units is considered acceptable, subject to the usual material considerations. The site is in part on a former quarry, and so there are changes of levels within the site. The next slide shows the steeping... Well, and the, sorry, if we can move to the next one after that, we will come back to the site plan. So this shows the existing steep rock face to the north of the site between Hunter's Ridge and the properties of Celtic Close. This slide shows the ground levels of plot two as 54.82 and the rear garden of 25 Celtic Close as 56.85. Therefore, the ground level of plot two will be nearly two metres lower than the rear of garden of 25 Celtic Close. The next slide shows the cross section from the public open space in the northeast through the plot to number two. Again, this shows the change in levels of just over 2.5 metres from the public open space into the site. And again, the ridge height of number one Hunter's Ridge is in an elevated position over plot two. The next slides show the elevations and floor plans for plot one. The walls are proposed to be of render with a natural slate roof, aluminium, or UPVC windows and doors. These are considered appropriate materials in this context given the character and architectural styles of the surrounding buildings. The next slide shows us plot two, where the elevations and floor plans are again for a four bedroom property with an ensuite and dressing room above the attached garage. Again, the materials are the same as plot one and are considered appropriate for that context. Concerns have been raised over potential overbearing and overlooking impact of the proposed dwellings on the existing properties, specifically that of Hunter's Ridge and the close to, close to, closest existing properties in Celtic Close. The next slide we have will show us the separation distances between these properties. As the sections have shown, the properties of Hunter's Ridge are in an elevated position and there is a dense tree and hedgerow in between. However, there is 16 metres between the rear of plot one and the side elevation of number one Hunter's Ridge. This meets the guidelines set out in the SPG. There is a closer distance between the garage of 6.8 metres. However, this is a single storey building and not habitable, so this is considered acceptable. There are habitable windows serving the bedrooms at the first floor of the rear of plot one. However, as these are 16 metres away from the side gable of number one Hunter's Ridge. In addition, as we've shown on this section, that these are a much lower level, with a 5.5 metre difference in ground levels between the properties. Hunter's Ridge being elevated with a 1.7 metre high fence on top of the ridge. Therefore, there is very limited impact of potential overlooking from plot one to one Hunter's Ridge. There is 7.9 metres between the front elevation of plot two and the front elevation of Hunter's Ridge. However, again, these are not directly in front of each other, and the level difference means that plot two is set down considerably, as shown on the side. The change in levels, boundary treatment, and offsetting of these properties mean that this arrangement is considered acceptable, and there isn't a detrimental impact on the amenities of Hunter's Ridge from plot one or plot two. To the northeast of the site, we need to consider the impact of the properties on Celtic Close. Plot 1 is 33 metres away from the closest property, number 25 Celtic Close. However, plot 2 is closest to 25 and 26. You can see the uh, distances there on the slide. Plot 2 is positioned at a right angle to these properties, meaning that the side gable elevation faces the rear of 25 and 26 Celtic Close. There are no windows on the gable elevation facing these properties, and the garage itself is lofted. There is so there's more single storey in relation to the house, meaning that the full two-storey height of the house is set back 11 metres from the boundary. In addition, there is a dense hedge and a 1.7 metre high fence in between. So if you could just go back to the section, please, showing plot two and number 25. That's the one, yep, thank you. 
The proposed ground levels for plot two are similar to the rear of 25 Celtic Close. However, the rear slopes upwards towards the plot two. This is approximately two metres higher than the ground level of plot two. Therefore, given the lack of windows to the gable elevation, the change in levels, dense planting which is to remain, the boundary treatments and offset angle, it is not considered that plot two would have an adverse impact in terms of overbearing or overlooking of either number 25 or 26 Celtic Close. There have also been concerns over the accuracy of the plans, however measurements have been checked on site and the plans before you today are considered to be accurate. In relation to the landscaping on site, this is to be retained mission of a full hard and soft landscaping plan together with the management and implementation conditions. This will also seek to enhance the current tree boundaries which retain an ecological bound value. Concerns have also been raised in relation to highway safety, capacity and access. The application has been considered by the Council's highway officers who, after changes and the reduction from two dwellings on site, raise no objections to the proposals. It is considered that the addition of two properties and the number of trips that this would create would not have a harmful effect on the local highway network. It is a significant sentence of Vinegar Hill that the road is dangerous and further dwellings would cause an unacceptable harm to highway safety. This application was initially proposed for four dwellings on site where the number of traffic movements was considered to have a detrimental impact. However, the application has been changed to two dwellings and the reduction in traffic movements is now considered to be at an acceptable level. So the next slide shows the existing access arrangements to Delfrin. Uh, keep going the other way. <laughs> Uh, that's the one. So the existing access arrangement of Delfrin is maintained to serve the additional two properties. Again, this access has been considered to be acceptable in highway safety terms, but some pruning and management of the trees of the entrance will be undertaken. So the next slide shows the position of an existing public rights of way in purple. To the northeast of the site, there is an area of public open space beyond the application site, which includes a public footpath which runs from Badger's Walk south to the main road. The public rights of way officer requested a public footpath to be included within the site to provide a more direct access from the open space and the houses beyond towards the school on the western side of Vinegar Hill. However, there are concerns with encouraging pedestrians to move through the site and use Vinegar Hill, creating an unnecessary conflict where there are no existing pavements. Therefore, this has been omitted from the proposals. It is not considered that the lack of a public right-of-way through the site is a reason to refuse the application, especially given the highway safety concerns and that an existing connection between the top of Badger's Walk and Vinegar Hill is present only a short way up the hill. So the following slides will show pictures of the existing site, as members saw on site yesterday. So this shows the changes in levels and the existing boundary treatments. This first photograph is, take, is looking northwest from the existing property of Delfrin, looking at the rear of Hunter's Ridge, existing access as it comes into the site. The next slide is looking in the opposite direction towards the properties of High Meads and Green Acres. So the next slide is showing towards the rear of the existing site with the properties of St. Melon's Close at the top beyond the open space. So this is just showing the difference in levels at the site. <laughs> the next slide is looking at the top of the site from number one, Hunter's Ridge. Again, showing the elevated position of this existing property. And the next, looking towards the rear of 25 and 26 Celtic Close. Again, you can see the um, change in levels and the fence there on top of the ridge. The next slide shows the elevation of Delfrin. So this is the existing property on site. And the next, looking towards the north of the site and the top gable end of one Hunter's Ridge can be seen there between the trees. And the next slide is just a general view, standing at the bottom, looking up through the site. And I think our last photograph then will show the access arrangements onto Vinegar Hill and the proximity of the neighbouring properties on the opposite side. 
Overall, the application has been amended to address the concerns of the highway officer and the planning officer in relation to proximity to adjacent properties and amenity. Therefore, the application before members today is now considered to be acceptable and addresses these concerns. It is therefore recommended for approval, subject to the conditions outlined in the officer's report. Thank you. Thank you, Amy. And uh, the local member uh, here is uh, Councillor Crook. Uh, Councillor Crook, would you like to uh, chip in? Yeah, thank you, Chair. Um, obviously, uh, it's been said that the previous application was for four properties, but refused on access and highway issues. Now the application is for two properties, uh, still with the poor access onto Vinegar Hill as far as the residents concerned and myself, but no recommended for approval as it is now having a lower vehicle movement taken on as being the main reason for the change of the policy for the highway approval. Or does, forgive me, the 106 money influence the approval of some 19,200? All this agreed when at the junction of the B4245 of Vinegar Hill is clearly signposted, unsuitable for HGVs, children in the middle of the road as there are no footpaths or even room for them to walk safely, no access to residential developments. However, I think that there are several issues to be addressed or conditions to be implemented to this approval. Clarification of the SUDS plan is still not available as far as I am concerned or I can see on the, on the portal. It is nice and good to see that the measurements have now been um, successfully put on the portal for people to read. Pity they weren't on the portal when we made the visit yesterday and I consider that to be a retrograde step. We would have got away with a lot more issues of residential complaining if they had actually understood and could see the official sizes. The access requires some attention as far as I'm concerned with regard to a wider display in the vegetation. Cut back both on the owner's property and that of Monmouthshire County Council's hedgerow, especially around the street light which is adjacent to the opening onto the poor access road onto Vinegale. My concerns still are still the safety of the children using this narrow road which has no pavement to walk to school on a daily basis and that we are continually allowing extra vehicles and maybe you could bring up the photograph that you had of the car going by uh, this access road and I have grave concerns of HGVs delivering to this site uh, at any circumstances at the present as the display is not big enough or wide enough to cope for it. So I still have reservations uh, of safety, for, especially for the children. But if you look at that photograph, you can see it quite clearly. Uh, that car is just an ordinary size vehicle and there is no room. You come out to that junction straight onto that wall, which is a, a house. You, uh, it's the very area where vehicles travel down Vinegale and they gain speed, the sharp bends at the top. Um, and I think somebody really ought to look at that at the school at 8 o'clock till 10 o'clock and 3 o'clock to 4 o'clock. It is absolutely unbelievable. I rest my case, but there, I'm sorry, I agree that we, we can't agree for this uh, development with a splay and access onto that road. Councillor, uh, thank you, Councillor Cook. Um, Mark, do you want to comment on the access and the highways? <coughs> By all means, Chair, I will comment on that. Um, I hear what the, the local member has said, and I understand his concerns, but I think we have to put this application in perspective. Um, it was originally for four, and I think in my comments, probably stepping outside the bounds of me being a highway development manager, more as a planner. I thought it was a too large a development, and the existing access was incapable of accommodating four vehicles. With two vehicles, and the addition of the existing dwell in Delfrin, I think it's more than capable of accommodating the access movements to and from these, to this development. And the impact on Vinegar Hill is considerably less. Um, I understand the emotive issue regarding pedestrians in this area, but in, if I could be candid, the pedestrians already exist in the area with what is a, quite a considerable development already in existence. So we have to be mindful that will two additional dwellings cause significant harm to the safety of highway users? And that includes all highway users, that's motorists, 
pedestrians and cyclists. And in my mind, it does not. The vehicle movement associated with two additional dwellings are very small, uh, between probably six to tw 10 um, movements per day, per unit. So during the course of a 16 hour working day, uh, day, that's very, very low numbers. So at peak times, for instance, when pedestrians may be there associated with the primary school, that may account to one additional vehicle on that road. So I think that's very low numbers. And as the highway authority, I'm supposed to comment in, in respect of whether it will call any material harm to the safety of users. And in my opinion, it does not. Regarding the construction activities, it's a valid point. Houses have to be built, but in doing so, they have to be mindful of the environment. A construction traffic management plan has been requested as part of a planning condition, and it will be up to the builder or the developer to be mindful of that and submit that to us for approval. Large vehicles can access Vinegar Hill, um, if they cannot access the particular development, they will have to size their vehicles accordingly. And uh, an example is roof trusses, for instance. A lot are prefabricated nowadays and are delivered en masse to site. In this case, that would probably, well, one would envisage that would not be the case, and they would probably have to be manufactured on site. Again, I expect that to be covered in the construction management plan for this development. Um, I think I've covered most of the issues there, um, but if there are any others, I'm more than happy to answer them. Amy, were there any points that you picked up that you wanted to uh, come in on before I go to members? Uh, I'd just like to um, clarify, I've noticed in the report that a uh, construction traffic management plan is not identified as one of the conditions in the report, um, but it does need to be, and I take on board everything that uh, the highs officer has mentioned, and the comments of Councillor Crook, and that will be added, so for recommendations for approval is subject to uh, the addition of that condition. Thank Chair. you, Amy. Um, we've got no... Chair, uh, can I come back, please? Uh, yes, okay. uh, We still have not got an answer on the subs uh, uh, drainage subs. plan. Sorry, apologies. Um, yeah, the SUDS application is a separate application, um, so all of the issues in terms of sustainable drainage will be addressed and, and managed through that application. Um, I think there were con some concerns that that was going to be unachievable. Um, if that is the case and they can't achieve SUDS um, and we need to amend the scheme and it, then some of those amendments would require modification of the planning application, then that then can be dealt with afterwards, uh, either a subsequent application or, if they are necessary, minor amendments. Okay, thank you, Amy. Um, we've got nobody from the town or community council. I've got no objectors registered to uh, speak, but uh, we have got a statement made by the uh, the applicant's a agent, which Phil is going to read out. Mark's going to. Oh, Mark's going to. Um, thanks, committee. So, yeah, we've got a, a statement from uh, Mr. Buckle, the agent for uh, the application, who is here, um, but unfortunately. Um, is unwell, so he's struggling to actually speak, hence we're reading it for him. Um, so uh, the statement says, thank you, Chair and members of the Planning Committee for the opportunity of speaking today. Um, statements by Glenn Buckle, Director of Buckle Chamberlain Partnership, um, and he's responsible for submission of the application. Um, the application was submitted in March 2021 and was originally for the construction of four dwellings. This was in line with the pre-application advice received in October 2019. Proposals received a number of objections which my client has taken on board and following lengthy consultations with planning and highways officers it was agreed to reduce the number of houses to two. We understand initial concerns by neighbours in Celtic Close and Hunters Ridge regarding overlooking and these have been addressed by providing uh, that the development will not overlook adjacent properties. We have provided site. We're proposing to keep the existing hedgerow and planting and to further screen the development. Any boundary fences which are found defective and owned by our client will be replaced or repaired on a like-for-like -like basis. The existing driveway is to be altered to improve manoeuvrability within the site and the proposed alterations have been discussed and agreed with highways. We have also agreed to provide electrical charging points for each dwelling. We've undertaken extensive ecological and tree surveys with existing hedgerows and planting to remain to the side and rear boundaries. 
The site has been tested in accord with SUDS compliance, and this information has been agreed with the SAB officer. Highway concerns are being acknowledged and dealt with. The existing access from Vinegar Hill is acceptable, and the entrance is only 160 metres from the B4245. There is good forward visibility, with at least 10 passing places where pedestrians can stand off the highway. Traffic speeds are suppressed along Vinegar Hill because of the natural alignment and width of the road. The existing access into the site has been used for at least 25 years and the Highway Authority has confirmed it will not be detrimental to highway safety. The site is within the Mega and Undy development boundary and provides a well-considered and sustainable development. The drainage proposals for foul and surface water have been accepted in principle and a separate SAB application will be submitted. The site layout addresses concerns raised by neighbours and is supported by planning officers. The street view from Finnegar Hill will remain unchanged and, uh, sorry, as the new dwellings will be well screened by existing uh, topography. Following the initial pre-application advice received in October 2019 and submission of a planning application in March 2021, my client has provided an extensive amount of information to support the scheme and I'd, uh, I would ask members to consider and approve the proposals as proposed for the construction of two dwellings. It should also be noted that the Plan Authority has previously granted permission for two dwellings on the site in 2011 and 2014. We are pleased that councillors and officers had the opportunity to visit the site yesterday and to see firsthand how well the site is screened by natural planting with no overlooking issues. So thanks, Chair and Committee. That's the statement from Glyn Buckle, who's the agent for the application. Thank you, Mark. Um, move on now to um, uh, members and uh, Councillor Bryn. Thank you for that. Uh, yeah, my initial question was about the SUDS, but you've answered that already. Um, the, other no the other note was that uh, I noticed the MCC Public Rights of Way maintained an objection to the proposed development um, until it contains public access linked to the play area. I wondered if the issue with the possible existing public footpath through the site had been resolved, because there was a, that, that issue was raised, saying that there might have been one already going along between, is it Celtic Close and the site? It's on the um, slide, which might help. Um, but yeah, the, the maps show that the existing public right of way is along Badger's walk. Uh, so it's the purple line. I'll get it up on the screen a sec. It's easier to show you on a map than it is to explain it. <laughs> There we go. So the site is kind of in the middle. There is a marker on it, but it's not that big. Um, it's not that clear. But the uh, yeah, the the, pub, the purple line shows the public right of way. So there is. It kind of follows the line of the public open space um, to the northwest of the site, but it doesn't go through the site. There isn't a public right of way on site at present, and the existing one would not be affected by this development. Okay, thank you, Amy. Um, I've got nobody else uh, put their, their, their hand up. Is there anybody else who wishes to speak? Can I ask you no. Can I ask you yeah. Yes, Mark. Um, thanks, Chair. If there's no other member comments, um, I just picked up on one thing that Councillor Crook queried um, when he was speaking, which, unless I misunderstood, was was asking whether or not the Section 106 contribution suite are recommended merits in terms of policy, part of which is a Section 106 contribution. So that in itself is a consideration if one isn't provided. That could be a reason for refusal. Um, but the fact they are providing one doesn't um, doesn't alter our assessment of anything else. Okay, thanks, Mark. Um, in that case, then, we have a recommendation for approval. Can I have somebody um, put that forward? Uh, thank you, Councillor Powell. Uh, somebody second that? Thanks, uh, Councillor Butler. Um, Richard, can we have the uh, vote in? Uh, Is that with the additional conditions? That's with the additional uh, conditions of the construction uh, management plan.
Right, we've got that up now. Uh, can everybody vote no, please? That's it. Okay, so that is approved. So uh, nine for approval, one against, and three abstained. Thank you, Paige. Uh, the next item on the agenda um, is uh, going to be deferred till later. Uh, we're going to deal now with item 6.5, which is application DM 2023-00592, the erection of one two-bedroom detached dwelling at Fair Pathways, Vinegar Hill, and the Cald Caldicott. Um, um, Phil, you're going to uh, present this yeah, one? I'm just going to open the... <laughs> Double multitasking, not really good, am I? There we are. <laughs> um, it's uh, in the eastern part of the Kirtledge of Pathways, a very large um, Kirtledge for that property. Um, it's a two story detached dwelling, Pathways, in a large plot, as said, 0.3 of a hectare. It's within the built up area of Undy, as you can see. There is um, some amenity open space to the site, uh, to the south of the site, but off site. Um, so this property is accessed off Vinegar Hill, where you see that, um, where the cursor is there, see that. Um, we had looked at the site yesterday. It's a private drive between two properties, Furbank to the north and Gwyn Royson to the south. And then it would come into the site um, and serve this proposed plot here. There are two other plots that have been approved in the past here and here in to the west of this particular plot. Um, so the current full application seats the erection of a two bedroom detached dwelling on this eastern side of the garden. Um, the plot would be about 570 square meters with a shared access from Vinegar Hill, as said. Uh, the new uh, dwelling would have accommodation over two floors for some of the accommodation in the roof. Um, and it would have a footprint of 10 metres by 7 metres with a ridge height of just under 6 metres, 5.95 metres. And it would be finished in smooth render with grey roof tiles. The principal windows would be on the side elevations, uh, which I'll come to in the slides in a moment. Um, and there would be roof lights in the north elevation. Um, so if you just go a little bit further, that shows the plot in situ. Um, uh, there's the private driveway. This is the access to serve the other plots. And then there's a, a sort of passing place that's been provided within the curtilage by the applicant, who also owns the rest of the garden. These are the parking spaces in here. That's the frontage facing um, towards the private driveway with main elevations looking to the side. Uh, and very few windows, as we'll see, on the southern elevation because of um, potential overlooking of Walnut House to the side with the plot here uh, via the private drive and then the, the continuation of the driveway to the two approved plots and pathways on the western edge of the, the large garden there. And that shows the access improvements proposed. And then that's the actual um, design of the house. You can see on the, the south elevation, to avoid overlooking, there's just two high level windows uh, looking down the slope to the, to the south towards Walnut House. Uh, and so the main elevations will be to the side, west and east. Um, 
So this application is a duplicate of a previous application, DM 2021-02078, which was refused um, by officers due to concerns over highway safety. Uh, the design was subsequently appealed and the proposal was considered by the PEDU's inspector. And the, the appeal was actually dismissed in April 2023, so recently. The inspector considered the reason for refusal, which the uh, council presented based on highway safety, and concluded that while that issue would not have warranted refusal of permission, uh, the harm and policy conflict associated with the absence of a completed legal agreement to secure afford affordable housing pr provision was sufficient to dismiss that particular appeal. But I'll come back to that appeal decision uh, in due course. The topography of the site slopes steeply from south to north, as we can see in, um, in the photographs. That's the access to the site. That's been changed, as we saw from site yesterday. It's been surfaced. Uh, certainly that splay to the left there, which was grassed, is now hard surfaced as an access improvement. Uh, that's the curtilage of Gwyn Royson, uh, and the site itself is to the right of this. Uh, and that's that's where the plot is, is is to be built. As you can see, it falls from the right down to the left, which is north down to south. And then that's pathways, which is the white rendered stone gable property in the far distance there. And then that's uh, where the uh, access would actually be widened um, uh, to lead to the other plots that have been approved. That's looking towards the uh, garden of Gwyn Royson. And then that's looking south towards Walnut House. Uh, that's a better, perhaps a better indication of how the site would sit um, looking down towards Walnut House. And there's a conifers planted uh, more recently by the applicant to screen. Similar, similar sort of view. And then also the garden of Gwyn Royson. And then those are the uh, substantive issues. So if I go back to the um, site plan, gives an indication of how the site would develop. So I'll leave it on that. Um, the property of the South Walnut House, as we see, is a dormer bungalow, and the two properties to the east are bungalows. There is a significant difference in ground levels in this area, but the relatively low ridge height of the proposal and the separation distances mean the new dwelling would not have an overbearing impact on the dormer bungalow to the south or any other dwelling either existing or yet to be built to the west. In terms of maintaining privacy, there should be a minimum of 21 metres between directly facing habitable uh, rooms on main elevations. Uh, and in this case, there would be about 20 metres between the rear elevation of the proposed dwelling and the main rear elevation of Walnut House. Although there is a conservatory projecting from the back of Walnut House, so that distance is actually less uh, in relation to that particular element. There is also a significant change in levels, with the slab level of the new dwelling being almost four metres higher than the finished floor level of Walnut House. In this case, however, because there would be only two high-level windows on the rear elevation of the new dwelling, there will not be any significant loss of privacy for the occupiers of Walnut House. The new dwelling will be built to the north of Walnut House, so it will not have an overbearing impact or reduce the sunlight to the neighbour's garden. And there, as we've noted from the photographs, is a 1.8 metre high close bordered fence along the common boundary, and trees have recently been planted, further mitigating any impact. <laughs> Uh, the east elevation of the proposed dwelling will face towards the rear garden of Glyn Royson. Um, <coughs> the east elevation of the new dwelling will be approximately 13 and a half metres from the common boundary with that property, and there is a low stone wall between the two. The habitable room windows of the new dwelling will overlook the end of the private rear garden of Glyn Royson, but not the dwelling itself. And given that the rear elevation of Glyn, Glyn Royson is approximately 25 metres from the eastern elevation of the new dwelling, it's proposed that the new dwelling will be served off the existing access uh, into pathways. This access would also serve the two new dwellings recently approved within the pathway site, as well as the existing dwelling. The existing access would therefore be expected to serve four properties in total. This access is between two existing properties, Gwyn Royson uh, to the south and Furbanks to the north of the access. The access track is relatively narrow for a length of approximately 40 metres. 
Highways requested that hard surface and drainage improvements be made to the existing axis as an integral part of planning application DM 2020-00234. Um, uh, that was for the two plots that were approved to the west of this current one. Uh, and with the exception of the tarmac and the new curbing, all of these improvements have now been completed as we saw yesterday. A previous application for one dwelling on this plot was refused by the council, as said, under delegated powers under DM 2021-02078. Um, at the time, highways requested more substantial improvement to the access to serve up to four properties off this high, uh, driveway. Uh, this decision was subject to an appeal, which was dismissed, but not on access grounds. In consideration of the access issue, the inspector said that um, they had assessed the practical risks to highway safety within the, co the context of the site constraints and the wider planning framework, policy framework. In considering such matters, it is necessary to note that the approved scheme for two dwellings includes highway improvements to the existing access drive to accommodate the anticipated increase in vehicle movements. A minimum width of 4.1 metres for the first 10 metres along the access from Vinegar Hill was agreed, as indicated on the approved plans. The appellant has provided evidence that the planning conditions relating to the highway improvement works have been discharged, and I could see that some works were underway during my site visit. I am therefore satisfied that such works can be considered as part of, an assess part of the assessment of this appeal." Unquote. The inspector concluded that, quoting again, having regard to the low traffic volume, the domestic use of the driveway, and the driveway width and alignment, I have little evidence to suggest that the proposed additional dwelling would give rise to any significant highway safety risks. The proposal would therefore comply with the relevant highway consideration set out in policy MV1 of the adopted LDP. So, unquote. <clears throat> so, highways have assessed the current application in the light of the appeal inspector's comments and acknowledge the inspector's rationale for accepting that a small additional dwelling would not harm highway safety via the limited improvements already agreed on the driveway, this private driveway off Vinegar Hill. The inspector also noted that the council refers, design stand, re refers to design standards for sh private shared driveways set out in the Welsh Government Common Standards released in June 2020. Um, the inspectors uh, questioned the status of, the stand uh, of these standards, um, but in any event, um, th they, have not been, they were not provided with a copy of the documents or any evidence of their use within Monmouthshire. Um, we can cl clarify that certainly with members in due course. Given the lack of clarity on these matters, and this is the inspector continuing, I am unable to attribute them significant weight in the determination of the appeal. I shall therefore assess the practical risks to highway safety within the context of the site constraints and the wider planning policy framework. So um, the standards referred to are the Common Standards Guide, which was produced by Welsh local authorities and other key stakeholders. Um, and this, this guide is in use by MCC Highways, um, uh, but it's not actually adopted supplementary planning guidance for use by the planning authority. Um, so the inspectors therefore gave it limited weight when determining the appeal. The authority do consider these standards to be good practice and that it's hoped that applications would generally be able to meet these requirements. However, it is noted that these are not adopted uh, supplementary planning guidance and even had the inspector, even had the inspector had sight of these documents, um, there's, there's, it's arguable that limited weight would have still been given to this guidance. And as a result, your officers concur with the inspector's position given the very limited additional traffic that would be generated by this proposal. The proposal is for the erection of a two-bedroom detached dwelling with no further improvements or amendments to the private shared drive other than what was approved under the 2020 application. So in conclusion, although the Highway Authority would welcome improvements to the shared private drive, the Highway Authority offers no objection to the application on the grounds that the current proposal would generate the same vehicular movements as 2021-02078 that was subject to the appeal decision, which concluded that that the proposed access was acceptable for the four dwellings that would be served off it. 
The application requires a sustainable drainage system. Therefore, SUDS techniques will be incorporated into the development. The applicant has had a pre-application meeting with the council's drainage engineers, and a full application can be made if planning permission is granted. But the possible SUDS components could include permeable paving, soakaways, infiltration trenches, swales, filter drains, and rainwater gardens, stroke SUDS planters. And water butts will be provided to clients um, with the principle of treating rainwater as a valuable natural resource. The sub authority have been in discussions with the applicant regarding uh, SUDS for this plot, as well as for plots one and two adjoining. And as this aspect is covered by separate legislation, a condition requiring details of surface water is not considered necessary for if, if consent is granted. Biodiversity enhancements have been included on the elevational drawing, and these are commensurate with the scale of the proposal. So the application in conclusion is recommended for approval subject to a section 106 agreement already signed and submitted by the applicant offering a financial contribution for affordable housing in the local area of approximately £6,500. Thank you. Thank you, Phil. And uh, again, the ward member is Councillor Cook. So, uh, Councillor Cook. Yeah, thank you, Chair. Um, I really can't agree with um, what has been said with the limited weight uh, uh, that, uh, of, the, of the inspector. Um, with this latest appeal, the inspector was not provided uh, with the adopted highway design standard policy due to an oversight within our local planning department. It's likely that if the inspector would have been in possession of the document, then he would have been in a better position to have understood our city and backed our LEP in their decision to refuse on the same grounds as if the document had been provided. It would have given significantly more weight to our case. However, there seems to be some internal confusion as to what MonCC's adopted highway standards are. I question why we did not make sure that we provided all the necessary documentation to the inspector so that he could have been able to make a better assessment of the safety issues relating to this highway in this particular application. For example, it's not up to the inspector to request further information or documentation. It's up to our officers to provide the correct level of information and documentation that the inspector can make the appropriate decisions for each case in question, especially with this application being so sensitive. So however, again, I am concerned of how we've handled this uh, uh, appeal and uh, really um, I just question um, whether we could have um, obtained a better result at this moment in time. Can I, can I sum up at a later stage when you've got the later uh, or the other? Yeah, yeah, I'll, uh, bring you in at the, at the end. Um, if I forget, John, I'm sure you'll remind me. I will remind you. Um, okay, um, Mark, do you want to come <coughs> in? Mark? Yeah, thanks, Chair, and thanks for those comments, Councillor Crook. Um, it was an oversight that the document wasn't provided, so we can only apologise for that. Um, however, I would say that um, I can't recall an occasion when an inspector's ever um, requested this before or hinged a decision on it, so I wouldn't personally agree it would have made that difference. I think what was most significant was the advice that they had from the highways officers um, and access to uh, planning committee's minutes and the recording of the meeting. Um, and also the site visit the inspector undertook um, would have been the most material factors. Um, I'm not sure if Mark can think of a case where it's been uh, requested before, but um, I, I can't. Um, the inspector can request additional information during their proceedings if they want. Um, it's unusual, but they can, um, and they didn't. So um, yeah, in an ideal world, it would have been provided up front. Um, with the benefit of hindsight, we can make sure that's done next time. But my personal view is I don't think it would make a, a difference to the uh, the outcome of that appeal um, with the inspector having been on site. But I guess the uh, the fact is we'll, we'll never know. Um, so, John, you've got one view. I've got another. Um, we, we won't know. Um, 
In terms of um, the actual guidance, it's, it's not adopted in a planning guidance sense, so it's not a supplementary planning guidance, but it is adopted um, in a highway sense that it's used by all authorities across Wales, um, was agreed by the County Surveyors Society in so June 2020, I think, Mark, um, and all authorities use it consistently. So again, it's not um, a bespoke Monmouthshire document that would be completely alien to a to planning inspector, as I, I wouldn't have thought. Um, but yeah, as I say at the, at the start, I hold our hands up and apologise that it wasn't sent. Um, clearly the inspector felt like uh, um, it should have been. Um, and it's a shame they didn't request it, but uh, we are where we are with that. Thanks, Chair. Thank you, Mark. Um, Mark, was there anything that you wanted to, to add from Highway's point of view? I have nothing further to add. I think that's well, well said. Thank you. Okay, thanks uh, for that. Um, we've got um, Sandra Lloyd now uh, wishes to come down and uh, address the committee. Sandy, you've got four minutes, and uh, don't forget to put your mic on and then switch it off after. Thanks very much. Is that okay? Yeah, just drop, just drop the mic down so it's level with your mouth and we hear you. That's fine. Good afternoon. This application is the third attempt to drop in another house onto the green infrastructure approved under a previous application on the wider site. That application originally included this third house, but it was removed due to overdevelopment concerns. This is gross abuse of the planning system, and if approved, sets an unacceptable precedent to developers that they can overcome overdevelopment concerns by putting green infrastructure on sites, getting them approved, then applying separately to build on that GI. The north elevation windows look out directly onto a 2.5 meter high retaining wall. The south elevation contains only two slit windows. The house is only 15 metres from the rear habitable rooms of Walnut House, but due to the steep site, the floor level is 4 metres higher and ridge height 10 metres higher. It will have a grossly overbearing impact on Walnut's amenity. The garden has limited usable space, mainly taken up by rain gardens and conifer trees. This is not placemaking. The access to the site narrows to only 2.8 metres bounded by high walls. The on-site road reduces to only 2 metres. There's a tight blind bend at the entrance to the site with an unprotected drop of 2.5 metres. No sweat path analysis has ever been conducted and larger vehicles cannot negotiate the bend. Construction supplies are to be brought in by tractor and trailer, which will be offloaded outside Furbank, causing a risk to their safety. The fire department has never made a site visit and there are no footpaths anywhere. The appeal inspector concludes the proposal does not give rise to harmful effects on highway safety. It's unclear why the inspector states it's acceptable for pedestrians, possibly with prams, toddlers or wheelchairs, to seek refuge on the steeply sloping rain gardens and small grass verges with a sway on one side and a steep drop on the other. There are no verges at all on the approach to the site. The LPA's reason for refusal on highways grounds was that it was non-compliant with policy MV1, which states developments will not be permitted that fail to provide a safe and easy access for road users and that developments will be expected to satisfy the adopted highway design guide. The LPA did not provide the inspector with this document, so he couldn't support that statement, nor did he have any information regarding the retaining wall. This site has major issues that have never been addressed. Please don't compound those issues by approving yet another house on this unsuitable site. It's an overdevelopment, has an overbearing effect on Walnut House and an unsafe road. Someone is going to get killed here. It does not comply with many local and national policies. 
catalogue of inadequacies. The original application was approved without a site visit from highways or the planning committee with the unsatisfactory reason given as time and cost. The refusal notice for the first drop-in application was issued under delegated powers, even though the ward member had requested it go to planning committee. This was a process breach, ultra vires and unlawful. The appeal inspector was not provided with the adopted highways We've design guide left, to assess compliance with policy MV1 due to an oversight. As we've already heard, it, we think it's highly unlikely that the inspector would have supported the right of the LPA to use their own adopted standards to assess compliance against their LDP policies and upheld the refusal. The LPA seemed confused as to what their adopted highway design guide is. The LPA do not seem to understand the fair dealing clause in copyright law, resulting in my objection not being Could published you start up now, on the planning portal for nine days. Finally, not all planning committee meet members go on site visits. Only half of members attended yesterday. The local government associations state one important principle is that a member can only take part in the debate and voting if they have also attended the site visit, so that all members have access to the same amount of information ensuring planning applications can be seen to be determined in a fair and reasonable manner. Thank you. <coughs> Phil, there was a couple of points there, but Mark, do you want to come in first? Um, yeah, two points I'll pick up on, Chair, if that's okay, um, in terms of some of the sort of procedural side of things. Um, I'm certainly not aware of any guidance that says that planning committee members cannot vote unless they've been on site visits. Um, Monmouthshire is actually pretty unique in the way we do these meetings um, and holding a site visit for every application. Most authorities don't do that. They'll do a committee site visit on request. Um, some go through without a committee visit. So um, from my past experience in other authorities, that's how it worked there. Um, the way Monmouthshire does it I think is really positive, um, but it's certainly not a, a requirement for making a decision um, that I've ever heard of or been aware of. Um, in terms of the initial application, again, I'm certainly not um, aware of any issue with the way the application was determined um, or it being called to committee and not done. Um, that would be a, an issue for a, a challenge um, either to the Ombudsman or Judicial Review at that stage rather than objection to this application, but I'm certainly not aware that that's the case. I don't recall hearing that before either. So, were there any other points to raise? Um, Phil? Yeah, just a couple. Um, in terms of the impact on uh, Walnut House, as, as I went through that, perhaps if I get the slides up again, I did go through that uh, in some detail before. Um, bear with. Um, in terms of the design of the house and its positioning, um, bear with. So, certainly in terms of the design of the house, there shouldn't be any overlooking from windows because of how it's been designed um, at the back there. It is quite low, the house as well. Even though it's perched above uh, Walnut House, it's, 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 it's relatively low in height, so it's almost like a bungalow, really, in terms of its design with, with um, uh, the bedrooms up in the sloping roof spaces, but obviously orientated away from Walnut House. Um, there's also sufficient distance between it and Walnut House in that the, 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 um, there's a roughly 20 metres between the main elevations of each, each property, and, they, and it's offset as well. If I show that, um, so that there's the, the proposed dwelling, and then there's Walnut House, so it's, it's slightly offset, plus there's vegetation on the back there which will grow up to further screen it, and the, the lack of windows in this elevation, which have also been removed by condition in terms of any future ones being added, uh, would mean that um, we could control any, any sort of uh, manage any potential relationship between the two properties. And in terms of this area being important green infrastructure for the, the, the two plots that were built here, that was, that's if you like, this was almost like a um, over and above what was required in terms of um, green infrastructure for the, to serve those two plots, which had sufficient green infrastructure in and around their garden and curtilage areas and in this area here. So this area certainly isn't what, what I'd call sacrosanct and absolutely essential to be retained um, as, as green infrastructure and is a fair and reasonable infill plot to our, to our minds as officers. Thank you. Thank you, Phil. Um, We've got um, th 
three members so far want to speak. Councillor Pin. Thank you, Councillor Murphy. Um, I know the concerns have been raised by residents and councillors regarding the increase in vehicle volumes on the narrowest part of Vinegar Hill and that these additional developments would generate. If we are to expect children to walk independently to the school here, which is within very easy walking distance, I wonder if there's anything we can do to mitigate the risks, which are increased by traffic volumes as well as speeds. Uh, considering vehicle volumes often peak at the same time as increased uh, pedestrian volumes, I wonder that Vinica Hill currently only displays um, warning sign letting vehicles know that pedestrians might be present on the road ahead. Would it be possible to change the signage to a pedestrian priority sign or else have a no entry sign at the top of the hill, encouraging the residents at the uppermost part of the hill to exit via the wider penny farthing lane? In this way, we might ensure that the character and the immunity of the area is not adversely affected by these new developments. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Pin. Uh, I think Mark or uh, either, either Mark or two. <laughs> uh, if I may, Chair, I'll try to attempt to answer the, the members' concerns here. Um, you're actually referencing the current situation with Vinegar Hill, um, uh, not dissimilar to the earlier application that, you, that we determined. The impact of this development on Vinegar Hill it will have no material harm or effect on the net on that network on that road. I think the issues you raise are f far more reaching than this application, and that's something we need to consider from a road safety aspect, active travel aspect, and so on and so forth. And it's something outside this application, in my opinion, and it's something that you may wish to raise in those um, sort of areas to uh, attract attention to this particular road and to promote and encourage safe use thereof, um, but I don't think we can consider that as part of this application. You um, don't, you don't think, sorry. You Councillor don't. Bain, um, if, if you'd like to email highways about that yeah. separately, okay. um, Mark will pick it up. Uh, Councillor Bond. Thank you, Chair. First of all, I'd like to echo what uh, Councillor Brin has just said, fully uh, support that, and it makes a lot of sense. Um, I've, although very uh, supportive of smaller affordable properties, as many of us are in Monmouthshire, because we're very short of properties, as we know, there's two points I'd like to raise, please. Um, I've got concerns, again, uh, about the issues with traffic increase of Vinegar Hill, and um, obviously the speed and everything just mentioned. So please can I check that the assessment for the vehicular movements, which is being quoted six to ten, I think, um, take into account the current situation, which is that more and more children, adult children, are now living with their parents. So um, a four bedroom house might have four adults in. Um, I just wondered if that would increase the number of movements that we're using as an assessment. Um, you could have yeah, three or four adults in one home. And you've already got two other, as we said yesterday, we've got two other uh, two properties, and of course they might have three or four adults in as well. Um, and secondly, um, can we please show and discuss what protection there is for this property, um, as it appears to be vulnerable to vehicles moving along the access of road, or the private driveway. It's actually on the corner, um, and to the other. Uh, for, to the other three properties that will be on that uh, plot or that area. As mentioned by the resident, it's quite an unprotected drop. And people come along there, drop straight into the, the building. What sort of protection, please? Thank you, Councillor uh, Bond. Uh, any officers want to pick up on that point before I bring Councillor Pell in? If I may, Chair, I'll, I'll, I'll pick up on the point regarding um, traffic movements. Um, the, the good member actually quoted me in when I stated on site yesterday, six to ten movements as being a typical uh, number of trips to and from residential dwellings. That's a very simple statement on my part, and I was just trying to put it in some context for members at the site visit. Um, 
traffic movements can be quite complex and really only relate to large developments where we use national guidance, which is known as TRICS data, which is sort of surveys taken of uh, large, uh, various sized developments of all, all, all types throughout the UK, and we average the trip movements associated with those developments, and that gives us, as transport planners, uh, an idea of what will be generated. We also have, uh, in Wales, we have the South East Wales Transport Model, where significant modelling has been undertaken by the Welsh Government to identify what the traffic movements at the AM and PM peaks of the day are. So uh, my apologies if I may have uh, confused members, but it was a very general statement just to give you an, an understanding of what you can expect from a residential property. Again, we all uh, live in dwellings, we all have cars, I hope, predominantly I'm sure, and we are fully aware of how many trip movements we make during the, the day. And I think six to ten is a fair assumption of what we can expect from an average house. And, that, and in saying that, this is a two bedroom dwelling, so I expect vehicle movements to be closer to six than ten in this instance. Um, I think that, uh, hopefully that's answered your question, has, has been helpful to other members as well. Uh, there was the point about um, about the uh, potential uh, vehicles dropping down onto the property. Yeah. There's, there's nothing indicated as a, as a barrier on the, the plans. Um, there's a retaining wall to be built between the, the, the driveway and the new property. Um, but if people are driving at the speeds that yeah. they should be along that relatively miles. narrow road, which is not more than 20 miles an hour, they should be able to avoid um, driving over the over the uh, the slope as it were so with there, the was a park, there was a park passing place right Further opposite on. opposite yeah. it yeah. if I, if I may jump in here chair um, I'm, I'm commenting well beyond my sphere here because I'm, I'm in charge of the highway network not um, this is a private drive that will be constructed f to facilitate access to fr for private dwellings in total, it's the responsibility of all users to ensure they drive to the appropriate uh, environment. In this case, if the, the property is, is below, I would expect all residents and those visiting those properties to have due care when they, they, they're driving along this private, and I emphasise private drive, uh, and it's the responsibility of both the property owner and others to safeguard that property. Thank you, Mark. Uh, Councillor Pell. Uh, yes, um, can I just come back, please? Sorry, sorry, beg your pardon. Can I just come back and say, should there not be a, some sort of indication or barrier, at least an indication? I think, I think leaving it to, to individuals um, is is unsafe, in my own opinion. But um, uh, I've said it now. I don't think it's a very safe situation at all, and I don't think it'd be a very nice place to live um, with how with cars coming above. Where you're sitting in the in the okay, uh, point uh, t taken. Uh, just bear with us a sec. Yeah, we can certainly add a condition um, requiring boundary treatments, and that we, you know, whether it's it's a sturdy hedge or or indeed um, some sort of low wall could be built there, but um, something to yeah to, to contain the, uh, the the slope, I suppose. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thanks, Councillor Bond. We'll yeah. we'll we'll put that in as as an additional condition. <laughs> Um, Councillor Powell. Yes, thank you, Chairman. This is just actually a comment. Uh, there was concern that not all the members went on the planning site visit. There are times when it's not convenient for all the planning committee to go on that particular day, but very often they do go on their own um, by themselves and visit things like this so that they have got the knowledge of it and they're quite entitled to do that. So it isn't always a case that it's only the ones that are on the bus that see the plans. So I think just to reassure people. Thank you. Yeah, thank you for that. Um, I got nobody else indicating that they wish to uh, Can I sum up, Jim? to speak. So uh, yes, uh, Councillor Cook. Yeah, thank you. Uh, may I ask for the um, photograph of the um, narrow poor access to be put up on the screen, please? Because we didn't make any issue of it whatsoever, but we did talk more extensively, that's it. That's fine, yeah.
So you can see this, this exit is far too narrow between Gwyn Royston and the first property. So how on earth are the materials and deliveries going to manage going forward with this development? As we could see yesterday in the visit, the, the, there were three commercial vehicles within 15 minutes. And one vehicle was a HGV lorry, which navigated the road, and I don't know how he did it with a skip, and quite clearly he would be unable to deliver a skip down that narrow entrance. So really we need to think about this entrance uh, and going forward, and certainly there's been no mention of the new properties that have been built at this present time. And I can assure you that when they're built 120 plus properties, the people will want to go down Vinegar Hill if they want to go east, and that will be a vast increase in traffic. And I know it's not a disapplication today, but I think there should be uh, indications and think of actually what's going to happen quite quickly uh, on Vinegar Hill. The, um, Strength and feelings of the local residents are absolutely vile and appalling. Uh, and we get, that's the ward members, Angela and myself, a daily basis of uh, emails and um, Facebook uh, comments. Uh, and it's not going to go away. With, this, with these two applications, it's going to increase. Uh, and we need to think of, of, of that going forward. As you know, my passion uh, is the village that I live in and the passion that I am concerned about are the children. And I just want to make sure that we protect those children going to school. And with that in mind, I cannot support this application. Thank you, Councillor Cook. Uh, can I just make an, an observation now? Would it be possible, and I know this is not part of this application, but it's been brought up, uh, at the top of Vinegar Hill, or on the bottom, something like, like that, it would be a matter for, for Mark, wouldn't it? Yeah, thanks, Chair, with, uh, with my highways hat on now. Um, we're already looking at this in the traffic and road safety team in terms of potential for a, a weight limit or a width limit up the road. Um, which would help with some issues with, with vehicles going through. Um, however, those restrictions still allow access to properties. So if somebody's having something delivered by a sofa company or a massive TV or something or a skip, that would still be permitted. Uh, really what should be happening is those people when they're ordering things should be saying, I live up this narrow road um, and uh, there's there's limitations on what you can get up there. Um, that's relatively standard. You know, when I've ordered a kitchen or whatever, um, you have to explain what the access to your property is like and how close lorries can get and if any width, um, width restrictions um, but that is something that they'll need to be doing themselves so we can certainly have a look at that um, residents access only would be a slightly different issue in that um, it would um, I guess again it's a moving vehicle event so it's still be enforced by the police um, but it's slightly hard, harder to argue but I'll raise that option as well with um, with Graham and the traffic and road safety team and um, we can look at the two alternatives um, uh, and go from there. Yeah, thank you, uh, Mark. Uh, you know, this is this is an ongoing issue, and if we can attack, can tackle it from a different uh, aspect, then uh, that could, could only help, can't it? Can I, on behalf of the of, of both our ward members, uh, that's uh, we need help and we need uh, some consideration going forward as to what we're going to do quickly, uh, rather than just. Uh, uh, what will happen in two or three years' time. We need some help right now. Okay, point made. Uh, Councillor Butler, quickly. Yes, um, sorry, just to ask really, will a construction management plan, or could it be a ad condition added to the approval? Yeah, there's a, there's a condition in the report, I think. Um, <coughs> And they've already submitted a plan already. Oh, there we are. Okay, sorry, missed yeah, that. That's okay. Don't worry. Yeah, it's quite a relatively short, succinct condition, okay. but they still have to comply with it. <laughs> okay, thank you. Okay, can I have a proposal, please, for approval as it's been recommended for approval by officers? Somebody wish to. Uh, to uh, recommend. Thank you, Councillor Butler. And seconded by Councillor Powell. Uh, with the additional uh, condition, yes. Um, Richard, can we have the vote in uh, that? 
Okay, we've got that. So uh, can everybody vote now, please? Okay, so that is appro approved. So we've got eight for approval, four against, and one abstain. Okay, thank you, Paige. Uh, we now go to uh, item 6.2. So we go back to the ag agenda as it's printed now. Um, an application DM 2021-00622, which is the retention of um, four small fans and the removal and replacement of the six larger fans at Atherston uh, in Turner's Wood, um, St. Morgan's. Um, it's... Um, this is the uh, chicken unit, which has got some uh, big extractor fans to control the heat in the uh, in the actual uh, building itself. Um, we have uh, Anthony Davis from uh, Environmental Health here to answer questions. But sorry, he's he's online, isn't he? Yeah, he's online. Okay. Yeah. Um, but uh, in the in the in the meantime, uh, Phil, you're going to. Uh, yeah. Do this one. Thank you. So this is a, an application for retention of four small fans, which I'll show you on the slides in a moment, and removal and replacement of the six larger fans. And it was a site we visited yesterday. <coughs> the free range egg production unit is, is long established. Um, planning permission for this poultry unit was originally granted um, to conform with best available techniques for poultry farming. The internal layout of the shed was altered in 2018 with external extraction fans added to improve ventilation. Uh, and these fans are now the subject of this planning application. Initially, this was a retrospective planning application for the retention of an earth bund and 10 extraction fans on the north facing gable. However, that arrangement was not considered acceptable having re regard to noise issues. The application was then changed, revised, identifying that the six existing larger fans in row two were the main source of the noise issues, which I'll show you just off the, off the main B road there on the way to Newcastle. That's the unit there, and if members recall, we came up that access road and stood in this area to, to have a look at the issues. Um, that was an earth bund that has recently been removed that was put in as a temporary measure to help baffle the noise. And the extraction fans are behind, were behind the earth bund, or are behind that. Um, so, yeah, those are the six noisiest fans in the second row, if you can like. So the top row were the approved fans. Um, so this application is to replace the six larger, if I can call them ugly, <laughs> uglier fans, uh, in the middle row, and then to retain the four um, sort of more, more traditional louvered sort of fans underneath them. So if I move on and leave it at that a moment. So, um, yeah, so the applicant's acoustic consultant advised the replacement of those six fans with quieter ones um, whilst retaining the four smaller fans in the in the bottom in row three there on the, on the, on the photograph. The external appearance of the replacement fans would be the same as those uh, of the previously proved fans in row one, and the fan mechanism would be concealed inside the shed. And on the outside of the shed, a louver casing will cover each of the fan openings. So it would look like that image on the right-hand side of the picture there. So the big sort of exhausts, if you like, um, would be removed, and the more traditional louvered pattern for the six quieter fans would be set in row two. Um, it's considered that the um, appearance of the replacement fans would be visually acceptable in this instance. They have a functional design, not considered to be an alien feature at four such poultry units. The shed is reasonably well screened by existing vegetation along the boundary of the field. 
Uh, and owing to the topography of the land, glimpses of the fans though can be seen, but this is unlikely to cause a significant adverse visual impact upon this part of the open countryside, and the proposal is acceptable in design and landscape terms. There have been neighbour objections, highlighting there's an ongoing noise issue from the existing fans, and the Council's Environmental Health Department has been consulted to ensure that the noise issue is appropriately addressed. Under the initial scheme, well, that was the retention of the, the, the six larger fans, as well as the ones below, it was proposed to build external housing for the fans. But from an environmental health and noise pollution perspective, that mitigation, once modelled, could not achieve the required standard of mitigation. And thus, the proposal is now in its current form to replace the larger extraction fans in row two with quieter ones behind louvers. A fresh acoustic report was submitted and the advice given by the Council's Environmental Health Department is that the resulting arrangement is likely to be audible at nearby noise sensitive properties from time to time but will be at a reduced level. And following Councillor, uh, I think it's Councillor Crook's um, query yesterday, um, the current measured rating decibel level um, from the British Standard Assessment conducted by Matrix Acoustic, Acoustics for the applicant is 37 decibels at the nearest dwelling, which is Sunny Mount, when all 12 fans are working. And with the change to the proposed replacement fans, um, the six fans there, during the evening and night, the absolute noise emissions, with all the fans being fully operational, is predicted to be low at 30 decibels at its highest. Um, and I think um, my colleague in environmental health, Anthony Davis, has got a, um, a, a um, he's got a, an image of what is a sort of the the, to, the sort of um, range of um, decibel levels which we all experience in our lives from day to day, and the scale of from very quiet up to noisy, and uh, and, and and then it rates them by decibel, which we can show the members afterwards to help them visualise or. Um, understand what, what that might mean um, in terms of the effect on the nearest neighbours. So environmental health conclude that they are not in a position to substantiate an objection to the application and to ensure that the fans are installed, managed and maintained in accordance with the manufacturer's instructions, the applicants will be required to submit written confirmation by an appropriately qualified acoustic consultant to verify that the noise levels are achieved within three months of their installation and this can be secured via an appropriately worded planning condition. Um, the earth bun that was initially constructed to try to mitigate the noise from the fans has been removed. This led to more recent concerns about an increase in level of noise audible at nearby dwellings. The earth bun was initially constructed to provide temporary noise mitigation until a permanent solution was found. And in any case, and as previously mentioned, a condition will be imposed to ensure that the required reduction in noise level at the nearest dwellings is achieved as set out in the supporting information. Therefore, as a result of these revisions, it's considered that the application is in accordance with local development plan policy EP1, which protects um, local amenity from issues like noise. The unit already has planning permission, and environmental concerns raised by local residents are regulated by other agencies. The proposal is to secure approval for the fans at the site only, and not the units themselves. Thus, there is no substantive reason to object to the application in respect of the building's use, the stocking of birds, or pollution controls, which are managed by Welsh Government and NRW. A biodiversity enhancement scheme will be required by condition as part of this permission. So we'd recommend approval subject to conditions. Thank you, Phil. Um, the board member is uh, Ian Chandler. So, uh, Councillor Chandler, would you like to uh, come in now? Yes, thank you, Chair. Um, I've been asked to uh, make a representation on behalf of uh, a number of residents uh, in the area who are adversely affected by the fans. Um, Mr. Tim B, Mr. Nigel Keane, uh, and Dr. Gates Pitts Tucker. Uh, and they live in homes that are to the north of the poultry shed, uh, directly in the direction that the fans are facing uh, on the other side of the road. 
Um, uh, they are saying uh, they've got three main points. One is about the general context. One is about the conditionality of the approval, and uh, and then a third about other issues. Um, in terms of the first point, the context, uh, they're not objecting to the revised application. They did object to the original retrospective application, uh, but they're not objecting to the revised application as it does appear that all those involved seem to be in favour as long as it results in a reduction in noise from the fans uh, and that they trust that this will be the case. Um, they do, though, make the comment that they feel that the planning committee report did not express the extent to what they have endured for the past five years in that the noise is a constant 24-hour problem that ebbs and flows and from which there is no escape while at home. Um, you've got to bear in mind that these fans kick in and kick out on an automatic thermostat, so that suddenly, without warning, suddenly it goes whoosh and then down again and then up. So it's, a, it's not as if it's a constant hum that you might get from a highway. It's a very intrusive noise. Um, they welcome the measures being put in place to ameliorate the problem after suffering the noise of the fans for such a long time, but they would like to point out that the, for them this is not a perfect solution. Even with the replacement fans, they will still at times be disturbed. And as a result of this development of the Atherston site, their enjoyment of their property will not return to how it was before 2018, and this is something that they feel aggrieved about. The second point in terms of the conditionality is they say that if planning permission is granted, they are very keen that careful checks will be made by appropriate professionals to ensure that the exact equipment as specified in the application is installed. And in terms of the follow-up noise verification checks outlined in the planning report, they would like to be given notice of when those noise assessments at their properties are to be carried out, because that hadn't happened in the past. Um, in addition, as the degree of noise disturbance is greatly influenced by the weather, they would ask that those checks should be carried out in appropriate weather conditions and on different days to provide certainty that the stated noise reduction has been achieved. Um, they point out that the noise that they suffer is worse on a warm, dry day when the wind is southerly, which of course is the type of uh, day or night uh, when they're going to either be outside of their homes uh, or the way the windows, their bedroom windows will be open, which is when they're going to experience the noise the most. Um, so that's what they would like to see on conditionality. Um, the third point is a, a little bit more general, and, uh, and it does relate to things that probably go beyond, as just been explained, the scope of the planning. But this... They say this revised application is concerned with the fans, um, but less important has been placed on the wider picture of the poultry farm. Um, despite what the, the, was said in the report that the um, fans were introduced because that was the best available technique in, uh, available in 2018, of course it was also because of the increasing numbers of birds that were being held in the poultry shed. So a substantial increase in the number of birds and the fans were in there were installed as we understand it, as they understand it, in order to accommodate a greater number of birds in the same space. So it's not just about improving animal welfare, it's about increasing the capacity of the shed. Is there their understanding. Uh, and they're concerned that this level, this issue of stocking levels has not been addressed and it's not been explained yeah, to them. The Chandler, that, can, can, can we stick to planning issues? Yeah, well, they, they, because they want, they're want they trying to make a, a link between the fact that the fans there are in relation to, to stocking levels uh, and about how those stocking levels comply with those animal welfare regulations or with the original planning permission that was granted for the sh two sheds you have uh, themselves used and that impact on the environment needs to be addressed. Thank you, Councillor Chandler. Um, Anthony, there were several uh, items there that related to environmental health. Uh, do you want to come in and uh, address some of those? Hello, everyone. Can you hear me, Chair? Yeah, fine. Thanks very much. Okay. Um, I would like to clarify something uh, in relation to the first assessment that was done. Uh, the first assessment um, was undertaken having regard to British Standard 4142 methods and commercial sound, which, which we asked for the report to be done to give us uh, levels of noise that would be uh, predicted at, at nearby premises. And... Um, the, the queries were, were, were raised at that point and, and they were, were answered. But the main reason why the acoustic housing 
wasn't progressed was because of ventilation issues. It, it wasn't in relation to noise. Uh, the noise issues uh, we were trying to sort of iron out, it was it was more of ventilation and the was proposed was in, excuse me, would um, not allow sufficient ventilation to um, allow the birds or to prevent mass suffocation, essentially. So it wasn't sort of decline on noise, but the, the, the subsequent application or, or subsequent report that has been provided to um, replace six uh, large fans in the middle bank of fans is a, is a better option. It, it's, 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 reducing, it's predicting to be a lower level of noise and there is a, a, a different sort of fan blade being used, um, a, a six bladed fan as opposed to a three bladed fan, which um, is, is uh, reported in um, uh, information provided to knock out the, the, the pulse that is, is associated with the current fan. Um, I think that's important to stress. Um, the, the other uh, the other issues uh chair with the other what we comment on or um i can show that um decibel if you will, uh, if you chart. will if you will please because it, it'll help members get a a, a a grip on on decibel levels to certain uh, things in life and and this has to be taken into context really um Sound basically is measured using instruments like sound level meters, and noise is then uh, the unwanted sound that is audible in the human ear, essentially. So if I can share this. Are we seeing that? Yeah. yeah. OK, so this is purely for th these are widely used. Um, charts to try and give an indication or an illustration of, of noise levels. Um, and the, the, the report is saying when the 12 gable end fans are working, the noise at the nearest noise sensitive property, Sunny Mount, sunny mount will be 30 decibels. The, the, the facade or the nearest facade of the the nearest noise sensitive property, which is Sunny Mount, which is approximately 340, 350 meters away from the gable end. So, I mean, there will be times because of the um, the, the nature of the environment there, where, where the background level will will drop to to 25. Uh, um, and you know there will be times where the fans will be audible, particularly on, on these occasions where um, th there will be warm summer evenings. Uh, the background level is low, but we feel on the information provided that you know we're not in a position to substantiate an objection. Also, throughout the, the night. There is um, another standard that comes into play, which is BS28233, which is guidance on sound insulation and noise reduction for buildings, which um, looks at uh, what the impact is internally uh, when when the noise is is to be 30 inside. There is at least a 10 decibel reduction inside. So we're looking at 20 decibels in, internally. So on, on balance, we, we are of the opinion that we, we can't object. We, we have uh, suggested appropriate conditions and we would, would, would hope to proceed by um, those being granted. Okay, thanks uh, very much for, uh, for, for for that. It was interesting to uh, see that effectively 30 de decibels, uh, decibels is more or less a, approximate to a, a whisper. I, I think, you know, it, it, it has to be taken in context. 
you know, these are widely illustrated um, graphs or, or demonstrations to, to give an indication. But every case has to be dealt with on its merits, really. Um, and, and, you know, we've, we've weighed up the, 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 the rating level of the decibel provided by the acoustic consultant and considered, you know, other issues. And, and we feel that we are not in a position to object, but we would like to condition the application appropriately. Okay, thanks very much for, for, for that. Um, we've got no other uh, speakers, so I'll go to um, members. Uh, Councillor Book. Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, I'm just curious to understand the reasons behind um, removal of the fund uh, that was originally uh, in the in one of the photographs. Um, and if there's uh, a, a you know, an idea of, of reducing further, maybe that fund or a noise reduction uh, fencing or something could be constructed um, where the bund was to prevent any further um, property. Um, to me, that sounds pretty reasonable and not uh, not too difficult to um, to agree to. Um, if that's uh, going to help reduce the sound further, surely that may be something we may wish to condi condition. Um, as well, so that we we add something further than just replacing the fans. Thank you, Chair. Yeah, I think that will uh, something that that could come out of the mo the monitoring because it'll be monitored professionally. So yeah, if there is a, a problem, that's a solution, isn't it? Uh, Councillor Bonfield. Thank you, Chair. Um, as far as I can see with this application, the, the applicant is trying to make an improvement with uh, sound re reduction in the fans. Um, so I'd like to propose that we accept this application. Thank you. Thank you for that. Councillor Bond. Thank you, Chair. Um, I was just going to say what um, Councillor Rook has already just said, but also whether there are options to put site these fans. I guess it'd be too costly to site them on another another face of the building. I think. That's been assessed already, and and the bund. Yeah, I think uh, those points have been uh, t taken. Uh, Councillor Howells. Yeah, sorry, uh, same as um, Chair, as, as Councillor uh, Rook. Um, I noticed there was a hedge there as well. Uh, I guess that would uh, um, act as a buffer. But um, I know that, you know, motorways have fencing that would act as buffers for adjoining properties. So yeah, if that could be, uh, has that been investigated at all? Um, also, just on the monitoring point, um, how frequently would that be done? And over what length of period would it be, a, um, you know, obviously the fans will run out at some, some or de uh, deteriorate after a, a, a length of period so would it be a, a maintained program of monitoring thank you okay i'll just take councillor powell and then i'll ask officers to comment on the, the several points that members have made councillor powell yeah thank you chairman um when we stood there yesterday uh, they're pointing out in what direction the neighboring houses were and when we looked towards back across the road i mean there was a tremendous lot of trees on that bank there and as we know trees do absorb the noise i found that where we live we were moved there 22 years ago and there have been some trees planted but they're very much immature and the noise from the heads of the valley road is quite considerable now the trees have grown up, you wouldn't know there's a road there. So it just shows how much is absorbed by vegetation. And there did seem quite a lot around that area, which I thought would have absorbed the sound quite a lot. So I, I support the application. OK, thanks for that. Um, Anthony, do you want to come back in on the frequency of monitoring or the effectiveness of uh, a bend or an acoustic fence? OK. Uh, the the um, figures that they've given in the, their latest report, uh, and we will be looking to to scrutinise that on receipt of it. And I think in the in our proposed conditions, we've asked for that to be submitted uh, within a particular time scale, three months of the installation of the fans, I believe, uh, if I'm not uh, mistaken. 
Um, as far as, as the earth bund is concerned, the, the, the earth bund has been removed um, and it, it, it appears that the earth bund may have been uh, suppressing noise from all the, the, uh, the original gable end. There were four fans on the bottom and it, it's likely that the, the, the earth bund was containing noise from that. So in discussions with the the, the um, applicant and the, and the noise consultant, if, if needed, that that will be reinstated uh, to control, as I understand, to control the noise from the middle bank of six fans would would involve quite a um, a, a different construction. Um, so we. we noise source by using the the upgraded fans essentially okay thanks for, for that uh, Phil from an officer point of view did anything crop up um, no as Anthony said the um, monitoring period within three months the installation of the new fans they have to provide um, an updated um, assessment um, uh, during the day, evening, and throughout the night, 11 p.m. to 7 a.m. with all fans operating. Um, and then if things aren't working properly, um, obviously we consult environmental health on that issue. Um, they have to provide details of uh, further mitigation. Um, uh, within one month of the date, the determination of the requirements of Part A are confirmed by the LPA. So, uh, and they, that, that will include details of an implementation timetable, and then development shall only proceed in accordance with the approved details and timetable, and shall be retained as such thereafter. So, there can be ongoing monitoring after that into the future, and I'm sure the residents will be the first to let us know if they think noise levels uh, uh, aren't working or, or are increasing, for, for instance, if the fans aren't working properly, and it's in, they need maintenance for instance. So uh, there is a safeguard in there for us to, to keep managing the process uh, for the benefit of the residents. Okay, thanks for that. And uh, Councillor Chandler, I'm sure you'll, um, you'll uh, l let us know if there's any ongoing issues. Um, you still have a little bit of, of uh, summing up time if you uh, want to come back in. Yeah, I would. Thanks, Chair. I mean, I appreciate that because I think that the point from the neighbours <coughs> is to do with the conditions and condition three um, is that they wanted to make sure that the noise monitoring is done at a time when actually the noise is at its worst rather than choosing a time when the noise is at its least. So I don't know whether we could specify that, but also in 3B, um, just clarifying the mitigating earth bund, uh, it sounds like the way that's worded is if the fans don't work, then we'll just reinstate the bund. Well, obviously the bund itself didn't work, which is why we've had the problem over the last five years. Uh, and so that doesn't seem to be an adequate mitigation um, if the fans don't work. So I'm a little bit unclear about the wording of three condition 3B, but Certainly with 3A, we want to make sure that actually notice is given to the residents when the monitoring is going to be done at their property um, and it is done at a time when uh, the noise is at its most intrusive. Thank you. Phil, to that... Um um, well, it, it'll have to be agreed with the residents because we'll have to go into their properties to, to monitor. So, uh, uh, and it'll obviously be done at a time when our environmental health officers consider that, from their professional point of view, to be appropriate. Um, yeah, I think that pretty yeah. well covers it, doesn't it? So, uh, yeah, I think sufficient has, has been set into the. Uh, process, Councillor Chandler, so uh, everybody's got the opportunity of monitoring it and, uh, and, and making it effective. Okay, Richard. Sorry, the, and the response about 3B uh, and about the bund, if the mitigation on that, uh, well, I didn't I get think, an answer to that. I think, I think um, far, far, far be it from the um, members here to uh, decide what the technical aspects are, uh, we'll leave that to those who are professionally uh, monitoring it. We have a proposal from uh, Councillor Bromfield and seconded, uh, I know somebody did, oh, Councillor Pell. Uh, so Richard, if we could have the uh, voting app, please. Okay, can we all vote now, please? Yeah. 
Yeah, and it's noted that Councillor Eason uh, has abstained because he had to leave the meeting, so he hasn't uh, he hasn't voted. Okay, so that is approved. Twelve for approval. Okay, thanks very much. Uh, we go on to uh, the next item now, which is DM two of the domestic garage at 60 Old Barn Way, Abergavenny. Um, we looked at this some some time ago, um, and. Um, it subsequently went to uh, appeal. Um, it's now come back. Um, so, uh, Phil, are you going to? Uh, you're yeah. going to do this, aren't you? Sorry, me again. I'm the <laughs> yeah, this is again one we we looked at about a year ago, and then we're, we're back again um, for this revised scheme. And a fair bit has happened in between, which I'll uh, uh, outline now. So planning consent was granted for a new double garage to the rear of the property in 2019. And this featured a, a, a garage with the following dimensions. So it was an eaves height of 2.2 meters, ridge height four meters, width six meters, and length seven meters. Um, so unfortunately the garage was subsequently built larger than the permission allowed. And as such an application was submitted to regularize these changes. The application acknowledged that the garage was built was too large and began reducing the scale. Uh, the second application proposed the following dimensions. So it was eaves height 2.8 roughly. Um, so obviously higher by 0.6 of a meter than, than approved. Ridge height 5.263 meters, so uh, over 1.2 meters higher than as approved. Width 6.4 meters, so 400 millimeters wider, and then length the same, seven meters. So that application was presented to committee in July 2022 with a recommendation for approval. That was not accepted by members who deferred the application for further negotiation with the applicant. And following that meeting, officers gave three options to the applicant, revert back to the original approved scheme, um, reduce the ridge by 500 mils and millimetres for further consideration or keep the proposal as it is, although members had expressed concerns with that option. And following discussions with officers, the applicant requested that committee members determine the application as originally presented, and on that basis, the application was refused. So the decision was appealed and dismissed. And in their report, the Perdue inspector noted that given its prominent position directly on the rear lane, it was considered that the scale of the garage would seriously undermine the character and appearance of this pleasant residential area and cause significant harm to the street scene, conflicting with policy DES1 of the LDP. And its height and scale would also result in an imposing form of development that would be visually over-dominant, exacerbated by the fact that the ground level of the appeal property is higher than number 58, the neighbours. Um, so the development would be inappropriate to its context and increase the sense of enclosure with adverse effects on the living conditions of the occupiers of number 58. As a result, the application has been amended uh, and the proposal um, the, uh, the, the ridge height has been reduced from 5.26 metres to 4.5 metres. So if I run through the slides, that was the scheme originally approved. Um, so it's um, four metres high, two, two eaves. That was the application that went to appeal. Um, members refused and went to appeal 5.26 metres high and 2.5. Sorry, I'm trying to read that. It's 2.4 metres to ridge. Yeah, to, to weave, sorry. And then this is the application that's now proposed. So it's 2.158 or two point, just under 2.2 .2 metres to eaves and 4.5 metres to ridge. Uh, finished in stone, as we saw on site. Um, uh, yeah, stone with uh, aluminium, I think, or UPVC windows and doors, aluminium, I think. No, dark grey PVC. So that's the the uh, site plan and view of the rear boundary um, on the originally approved scheme. That was a previously refused proposal, which was deemed to be overbearing, excessive in height and scale does look considerably higher. And then this is the site plan as now proposed. So if I go back to the, um, I'll just show you some pictures of the site, although we, some of us did go there yesterday. So the um, wall plate's being brought down. 
to a more modest level. That's the rear lane. That's looking back down the lane. And that's the view from Hereford Road, but you can't really see it because of the uh, the vegetation and the sort of uh, bun there that's between the main road and uh, and the the lane at the back of Old Barn Way. And then that's looking back with the, the site on the left. Um, so if I go back to the um, proposed elevation, leave it on that. That's it there. So. Um, so the current, um, so as a starting point, it's probably worth noting that permitted development rights would normally allow, without planning permission, a building 2.5 metres to eaves, um, so more than they're currently proposing, uh, and four metres ridge height, so half a metre below what they are proposing here, provided that the footprint would not exceed 50% of the total curtilage, which, which again, this wouldn't in this instance. So the current drawings show a reduction in height of 0.763 metres compared to the recent refusal, resulting in a building with a ridge height 0.5 metres higher than the original approval, or what could be done under permitted development rights. Uh, and what, what I would say uh, to members is what you can do at permit, under permitted development isn't a benchmark about what is acceptable, it's just what you can do without planning permission. And then beyond that, we then look at it as professionals and as members, uh, skilled members, to make a decision as to what's appropriate in that context. Um, the natural stone cladding does add external width to the building, um, but it's considered that it's fair and reasonable for the applicant to use traditional materials that will improve the overall appearance of the building. And the finish of the garage was not raised as an issue by the inspector, who acknowledged that it's been constructed with a high quality finish with, a complementary, with complementary natural materials. Um, it's also worth noting that Whilst there are other garages along there which are smaller generally, um, they're probably not the sort of garages which would um, be where, what we would approve under the uh, garages supplementary planning guidance that we have now whereby internally garages need to be six metres by three metres to actually be capable of accommodating a car and having some storage space within the garage um, to allow some utility um, for that, for that building, um, and obviously modern cars are actually largely larger, largely wider, a lot, uh, and sometimes longer than they were about 20 to 30 years ago when a lot of these garages would have been built. So one can expect garages these days to be larger um, than than they would be built years ago. So we consider the design of the garage to be typical of a domestic garage with some limited storage space in the roof, but it's certainly not capable of um, uh, having any sort of um, livable accommodation within that roof area. It's certainly not high enough. Because, um, number 62 is to the north, 58 to the south. Number 60, 62 is located um, to the north and separated by a footpath. The proposed garage would be located approximately 16 metres at an oblique angle from the rear of number 62. Um, set at a lower ground level due to the topography of the area, and given those separation distances with the relatively um, modest scale of the garage as amended, the proposal would not have an adverse impact on the amenity of number 62. Number 58 is the semi-detached dwelling attached to the host property, number 60, and the dwelling that this garage would, uh, which is the dwelling that this garage would serve. So number 58 um, is lower down, um, and it has a garage um, close to the common boundary with the property. Uh, it has a much closer relationship uh, with, with the proposed garage um, and has an existing, as I've said, garage along the common boundary with the application site, the new garage being located alongside it. Um, the proposed garage at the site now proposed would be partially screened by the existing garage and thus having a, fa a reasonably limited effect is allowed and must not prejudice the determination of this latest application which must be considered on its merits and subject to the amendments now proposed and there is adequate immunity space retained at the property. So we would recommend approval at the revised height of 4.5 metres to the ridge 
As this is partly retrospective, there is a need to condition that the scheme is completed in accordance with approved drawings within a reasonable time scale. And I would suggest that's six months uh, from the date of the permission. So I'd add that as a condition if members are minded to approve. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Phil. And I know from listening to the applicant yesterday, he's very anxious to uh, to get on with it. So uh, I'm sure you'll you'll fit in with that condition. Um, the local members, Councillor Gokut. So uh, you could do it from the chair there, if you like. Uh, uh, thank you, Chair. Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm here as the local member for Lansdowne Ward to represent the row of uh, neighbours for this house, uh, all of whom oppose it except the resident at number 60, uh, which of course is where the application is for. Uh, she's a tenant. The actual applicant does not live at the house. Um, I would like to make a few points based in part on what this committee said in refusing the last application, uh, in part uh, on what the inspector found, uh, and in part on comment that has been made. But perhaps if I could quote you the minutes of your meeting when you rejected this, uh, and the reason why you refused permission, the minutes say the garage has a large footprint that was considered too large a footprint. Much has been said about the height. Much of what I'm going to say is about the footprint. Um, the reasons that were formally given for refusal of the previous application uh, is that by virtue of its unacceptable scale and mass, the proposal fails to respect the existing form, scale, massing and layout of its setting and is therefore contrary to the LDP. Um, I'd like to quote from the report of the inspector, which is very telling. Even with a reduction in height, it would continue to be an imposing and visually dominant building, out of keeping with the character and appearance of the area. Concerns have been raised by neighbouring residents that the garage has an overbearing impact on their properties and negatively impacts on their living conditions. I would agree. From the rear-facing garden and in, view, in views from the rear-facing of 58 Old Barn Way, the outlook would be dominated by a mass of built form. The development is inappropriate to its context. Today, the applicant has put a new document onto the portal. It's lucky I looked at it this morning. Uh, it says, the footprint has been substantially reduced. Well, I find that bizarre, so I checked the definition of a footprint. It is, a building footprint provides an outline of a building drawn along the exterior walls with a description of the exact size, shape, and location of the foundation. From the original permission that was granted in 2019, you add the substantial cladding, and in fact, far from a reduction, the footprint has grown substantially. So much, in fact, that the building cannot now actually be completed. Because if you look at the photograph I've just passed around, the, cla the, the, the brickwork cannot be put down one side because it is only 400 millimeters from the garage at number 58. I don't know how the applicant is going to put on his guttering for the soaker ways that the application talks about. The application talks about two 10 meter soaker ways. Well, I sent you a, a picture there. Uh, it's, it's probably not even 10 feet, let alone 10 meters. You're nearly on your four minutes, Matt. Okay, thanks. So, um, all in all, I think that what we've got here 
is a building out of scale, totally dominating. Um, the report submitted by the officer keeps talking about it being a garage. It is an outbuilding, as are every other building along that row of Old Barn Way. No other building is higher than 2.4 metres. So this remains a gross building out of any context with its neighbourhood. Thank you, Chair. Thanks very much for that. Um, we've got no other speakers uh, on this. Um, No, we haven't. So um, we go to uh, officers. If there's any particular points you want to raise on that before I get Sorry? Hands up. Yeah, I know, but do, do you want to, uh, any points that you want to um, come back in on before I do that? Yeah, I mean, we're not saying it's the footprint's uh, smaller. I mean, the applicant might have mentioned that, but it is, it's uh, 6.4 metres wide, which is. Um, 0.4 wider than it was originally approved. What I would point out, what we're really, what, what we're looking at. I mean, you, you could build a garage that that wide under permitted development rights anyway. Um, so it's a little bit of a um, red herring, really, to to get hooked on the width of it. Um, you can still. You could still finish it off. For instance, they could they could probably render that side elevation. And it's it's interesting that the neighbour's garage is built close closer to the boundary than this this would be to the boundary uh, here. So um, you know it's not not really the fault of the applicant that the neighbour's garage is right up on the boundary. So um, that's a common relationship, common issue. It's it's a maintenance issue. So it's a, a civil matter. Um, yeah, the length is the same. Um, as, as it was originally uh, proposed, it's just that the height, the height, so it's point, point 0.4 of a metre wider than approved, and it's point 0.5 of a metre wider than approved. So members have to really gauge whether that difference is harmful beyond what we've actually approved. Um, as uh, we've we've actually approved. Thank you, Phil. Uh, thanks very much. Uh, uh, Councillor Powell. Thank you, Chairman. Oh, sorry. Thank you, Chairman. Um, I'm afraid I'm not happy with this. Um, if, they'd agree, if they'd gone with what we agreed at the very start and did it four metres, we wouldn't have all this problem now. And we've, had, we've made them lower it down. Why are they persisting and having it 4.5? I know it sound, doesn't sound much, but I'm 0.5 of a metre is... Something like this, isn't it? Yeah. And um, I, I think they're just being a little bit facetious myself because they know darn well that um, we didn't want it to be higher. And um, I think we should make them go to four, four metres because that was what the original plan was. And, I, and I, uh, I'm not at all happy with, the, with it either because I know it looks beautiful, that stone cladding, yes, but it does put an, an extra width on it. And... Uh, you know, it, in the area there, it, it stands out like a sore thumb. But, um, you know, I just can't go with this you know, creeping and having this 5.5 metres because they think, oh, we'll be good, we'll lower it down to 4.5, they'll accept that. It should be, it should be that four, the 4 metres... OK, thank you for that. Councillor Butler. Thank you, Chair. Um, I have to say I'm probably not the only one who thought this. When, it, when I saw it again appearing before us... Uh, it was a, really just a bit of despair, really. I mean, even with the adjustments that have been suggested, we're still 0.5 metres, as my colleague says, quite some considerable uh, height um, than the original plan. Uh, and basically what that means, and I did speak to the applicant yesterday about this, is as you, you drop the pitch of the roof, um, it basically means that it's hard to achieve sat you know, a satisfactory pitch for the slates he's going to have to put on it. So even with the adjustments, I don't think it, it, it's going to satisfy anyone. I don't think the applicant's going to be satisfied with that. I certainly don't think any of the residents will be satisfied because this is very much, I'm going to use the word again, over-dominant. Um, it's completely out of scale and character with the rest of the um, 
the the street scene there. So I really I just feel don't feel that I can support this either. Um, and the, the particularly uh, it has been said again that the footprint um, 0.4 meters not insignificant, and it's just completely over dominant in my opinion, and I really cannot support it. Thank you, Chair. Okay, thank you, uh, Councillor Book. Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, the problem we have with the roof comes from the fact that they've uh, increased the width of the building. 400 millimetres doesn't sound an awful lot. Um, I'm coming from a from a building perspective. I've been in, uh, in in the game for a very long time. To allow for a, a pitch of the roof to be able to shed rain and snow. Um, the problem comes from the route that the building is wider. If the building was at six metres, I think it was six metres as uh, originally agreed, the roof would probably be, probably not quite four metres, but just slightly over, probably 4.1, somewhere around there. Um, so the problem comes because the building is wider. Um, and and <laughs> to remedy that, that means removing all of the cladding and going back to the, the uh, existing block work that's adding to, to get that footprint right. Um, that would be the only way that um, he'd be able to reduce the, the height of the um, the roof any further. Um, I'm not sure how we ask him to do that um, without without um, having some serious backlash. Um, but it's 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 the way it it, it would need to be if uh, if we're going to reduce the height any further. Thank you, Chair. Uh, yes, thank you, Councillor. Uh, Councillor Howells. Thank you, Chair. Um, I, I, just, I, I wonder if uh, the officers could remind us of what we agreed at the uh, previous uh, um, uh, application for this. I, I understood that uh, our options then were to reduce or refuse it, uh, or accept it, or to reduce it to 4.5 then. Uh, I might be wrong in that assumption. Uh, and with regards to the soakaway that Councillor Grocock brought attention to, 10 metres, is that really realistic? It's uh, 10 metres, that's, uh, I don't know, it's a, a very, deep, very deep hole. That wouldn't be a building requirement, surely, for a soakaway. Yes, it would be a, a very large hole. Uh, in 30, foot, garden. 30 foot in my old fashioned imperial way. Yeah. It's, uh, I don't think anyone would be expected to build a, a soak away that deep. I might be wrong. Officers, can you help us out on that? Um, well, it was, it was suggested, so it wasn't, it wasn't a. It was only I think the point on the um, on the the, the the width was that uh, he could do that under permitted development anyway, so that causes a little bit of a problem there, doesn't it? Yeah, Chair, if I can help answer some of those questions. So the the previous um, recommendation um, that Councillor Howells mentioned was. Um, was talking about either um, the applicant being required to revert it back to the original scheme, um, suggestion of reducing it by 500 mil, um, which is essentially what we're talking about today. Um, no, sorry, it's more than that. Um, or uh, keeping the proposal as it is. So what you're being asked to consider today is 500 mil more than the original approval, whereas that was talking about 500 mil um, less than as built. Yeah, um, if I'm reading that correctly, which would be 4.7. Yeah, yeah. So it's down to 4.5 now. Um, I would I would urge committee members to focus on the impact of the building and what they think, so along the lines that Councillor Butler was talking about, rather than um, you know whether or not the applicant's been to in and fro in and should have just done uh, what the consent said in the first place. Forget about those actions and, and uh, motives. Um, just think about what the end building will be like and whether or not 4.5 um, high would be acceptable or not. Um, in terms of um, Councillor Rook's um, comments, um, I'll defer to his expertise as a, as a builder. Um, 
but yeah, it could well be that reducing the ridge height any further means that the entire roof needs to be rebuilt. Um, the applicant's suggesting that they'd need different um, roofing materials to cope with a, a shallower pitch, but that is feasible, um, that is doable. I'd suggest that's probably better than rebuilding the side walls and the, the width of the building. Um, but um, those are the different options sort of available to you. Um, soakaways, I'm afraid I don't know the technical answer to that. Um, 10 square meters. It's 10 square meters. Um, Phil saying the report's talking about, so it's a, it's an area um, rather than a, than a distance or a depth. There are there are requirements uh, in the guidance about how close these soakways go to other buildings um, and the dwelling itself. Um, I don't know those off by heart. They'd be catered for within uh, within building regs. I'd have thought if this falls within the scope of building regs, which I think it probably would because it's um, relatively big. I've got nobody else wishing to speak uh, on, on this, so uh, unless officers have got something else to, to add, uh, I'll ask Richard to put the, the voting function up. Yeah, uh, I just check in to make sure officers have got nothing up. No? No, okay. Right, so we move to it. Um, um, it's been recommended for approval, so I know we have some uh, people who've indicated that they can't vote for approval, but is anybody prepared to recommend approval? No? So... Yeah, Dale, um, Dale's put his hand up. Dale's put his hand up. Yeah, oh, right. Sorry, I, uh, I couldn't say it. Right, so we've got uh, approval from, uh, from, from Councillor Rook. Anybody second that? Councillor Hells. Okay, so can we have uh, the voting function up, please, Richard? Okay, you've got the voting function up. Can we do our votes now, please? We have one short. Can everybody vote again, please? Uh, I, I don't know, it's, it's, it's clear, though, isn't it? Yeah. This should, should be 13. No, he's not on the committee. There should, there should be 13, shouldn't there? Not 13, aren't there, Phil? Anyway, it's... It's, it, uh. Uh, it's approved, so seven for approval, three against, and two abstained. Okay, thanks for that. We then move on to the last one uh, before us today, before we look at the um, the final item, which is an appeal decision. Uh, this one is DM 20230391, proposed building associated with existing agricultural land use at Land Any Walks Road. Um, uh, Amy, you're doing that one. Thank you very much, Chair. Um, yes, uh, this is the last application before you today, and it's before you due to the number of unresolved objections received. The proposed building has in fact been erected on site and is nearly finished as members on their site visits yesterday, so therefore this application is in part retrospect. However, members are respectfully requested to consider the merits of the application as if the works had not already started on site. So the slide shows the position of the outbuilding south of Landeni Walk, situated to the west of the hamlet of Landeni. The proposed building is to be used for storage of equipment and small welfare utility room associated with the agricultural use of the land. 
LDP policy RE4 supports new buildings within the countryside, provided they are to support agriculture or forestry. They are subject to the criteria that the buildings are necessary, that they would not have a detrimental impact on the landscape. So in this instance, the building will serve an agricultural holding comprising of 7.2 hectares of grazing pasture with livestock. That's four working horses and currently 36 ewes and 24 lambs. Given the limited scale of the building, having a length of 14.2 metres and a width of 3.6 metres and a height and to the ridge of 3.8 metres is considered in scale with the land holding. So the next slide we have shows the position of the building adjacent to the field boundary close to the existing access. There are no additional tracks or hard landscaping proposed. The plan shows an additional planting to the hedgerow facing the road in order to bolster and improve the screening of the building to the roadside. In addition, further planting is also proposed to the front of the building to soften the views of the building when looking from the west. The building's finished in metal sheeting to have the walls and roof further help the building integrate with the landscape. It's quite common to have corrugated metal sheet agricultural buildings within the landscape such as this. Therefore, the application is considered acceptable in accordance with policy LC5 relating to the protection of landscape character. So the next slide shows the elevations of the building, as it can be seen. This is a simple pitched roof on a single storey linear building. The previous drawing showed more domestic detailing, which had been changed to incorporate a more utilitarian character, which is now considered to be more appropriate with a landscape. The application has been considered by the Green Infrastructure and Landscape Officer, who requested additional planting as noted, and that has been shown on the plans and is now satisfied that the proposals do not have an inverse adverse impact on the wider landscape. So the next slide shows the details of the materials and the plan of the building, showing an open space for storage with a small utility and welfare use in the small room at the end. This accommodates a toilet which has been specified to be a composting toilet and so will not have any adverse impact on the environment or any implications in terms of phosphates. In addition, surfaces around the building are permeable and it's considered that all surface water will drain into a soakaway. The next slide shows the proposed development within the landscape. Whilst the building can be seen in long distance views, it is not considered to have a detrimental impact given the scale and appearance of the building. So the next slide shows the existing access from the lane into the site. There are no proposed changes to the access and the development is not considered to intensify the use to warrant any such changes. The highways officers consider the proposals and satisfy the existing access arrangements are suitable. The next slide shows the roof of the building from the lane, showing the extent of building visible from the east. There is proposed to be additional planting along this hedge to help maintain it and ensure that it cont continues to provide screening. In addition, the planting also provides the necessary biodiversity net benefit required in all applications. A condition is proposed to ensure that the landscaping is maintained for a minimum of five years. So the next slide shows the existing use of the land. For agriculture, you can see the horses there, the working horses in the middle. The next slide shows the existing building at the time that the photographs were, were taken, but I understand that that cladding has now been applied to the front, as you could see yesterday on your site visits. So the next slide shows the other agricultural paraphernalia on site, with a building in the background, you can just see the gable end of it. And the next slide shows the rear of the building, again being clad in the corrugated sheeting. Um, Concerns have been raised by a number of objectors that the building would be used for an alternative use, positive, possibly residential, but the application before members today is for a storage building to be used and for the purposes of storage of equipment necessary for keeping the livestock and supporting the agricultural use of the land. This has been further reinforced by a specific condition prescribing and restricting the use for the building just for storage. Given its scale and construction, it is unlikely to be suitable for any other purpose without alteration, but concerns that this could be converted to residential use in the future. However, this would require a separate planning application and will be considered on its own merits. A conversion to residential, for example, would be unlikely to be granted planning permission due to the current policy restricting the use of modern farming buildings for residential use in the future. 
So overall, the application is recommended for approval, subject to the conditions attached in the officer's report, given that it is considered justified in relation to the agricultural use of the land and does not have a detrimental impact on the wider landscape. Thank you. Thank you, Amy. I've got nobody uh, registered to speak on this, so Councillor Rook. Uh, thank you ever so much, Chair. Um, on our site visit yesterday, it was uh, it was noted the uh, the quality of the flooring in the um, in in the uh, the building. Um, I'm pleased to see that uh, we're conditioning these concerned building, though not being used for habitation, may end up being used uh, as business accommodation. So running the business um, that the lady. Um, manages from there. Um, if that happens, um, it could possibly see an increase in, in visitors to the site if the business is managed from there. Um, so I'm pleased to see the condition is there. Um, how do we go about monitoring uh, the use of the building once we've, uh, or, or if we agree, um, approval? Thank you. I would imagine the uh, local residents will be uh, to, to, doing that, that for us. Um, but I, uh, uh, Councillor Butler. Yes, thank you. Um, I would also like to um, approve this application. What I particularly liked yesterday, and I hope this is not a variation, is that the the applicant in question ha has actually used cedar wood on the front of the building, which makes it much more aesthetically pleasing for the farm, which is two fields away that might be looking at it, um, most of which she had felled herself. Um, so she's. Uh, as I, I, was, I thought that was great. I also noted that the the window and doors that she used, she'd actually reclaimed, so she'd recycled materials as well. So um, I, I just uh, thoroughly approve this application. Thank you. I understand. Thanks for that. I understand though, that the those uh, double doors will be replaced with, with wooden ones in in. Uh, in the completion of the uh, the uh, item, um, officers have, have got any uh, thing to add on to uh, the points that Councillor Wilk made. Um, yeah, what I what I would just add is that. Um, the internal flooring. I've had comments that that was a high quality flooring in inside. Um, what flooring the applicant chooses to use inside is her own choice. Um, and that's absolutely fine, as, you, as uh, Councillor Rook has identified, there is a condition restricting that to storage. But I think um, the applicant isn't going to be storing kind of heavy machinery or tractors in there or anything like that, obviously. Um, it is going to be more lighter uh, kind of equipment induced, required in relation to the management of the horses mainly and, and some of the livestock on, on site. Um, great to note that uh, the notes about the building being sustainable. I think there was one other comment that I think I failed to come back on. Is there another point that was raised? Ah, oh, yes, the monitoring the use of the building, yes. Um, as, as Chair has mentioned, it's probably going to be some natural surveillance going on um, from residents around, which would be identified if something did happen. But our enforcement officers can go out and check and make sure that the use that is proposed and it is restricted by that condition is being complied with. Okay, thank you, Amy. You've got nobody else uh, wishing to speak. Uh, Councillor Butler's um, proposed... Uh, Acceptance. Do I have a seconder for that? Council holding function up then, Richard, please. Okay, can we vote now, please? Okay, that's approved. 12 for approval. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, so that's the end of the applications, but we do have a, um, an enforcement decision to uh, look at. And Phil, I believe you're going to yeah, talk us through that. Very briefly, as your members will know this <laughs> this area quite well. You're, you're um, not on mic. Oh, sorry. Yeah, sorry, Chair. Um, yeah, it's 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 the large roundabout at the end of the Y Valley Link Road, the A466, I think it is. Um, before you get turn, you can turn left as you come down in a southerly direction. Turn left to Thornwell, or you can go onto the uh, the old Seven Bridge there, past Riverside Court. 
it's a, it's the edge of the rugby ground, and there was an application to put up a um, six meter by three meter wide um, digital display advert. Um, it was obviously give <laughs> give give the landlord some some revenue, but it was it's a clearly a bold sort of advertising proposal. Uh, there was an objection from Welsh Government Highways that it would cause a distraction, so it would go. Um, sorry, just have a look at that sign there. It would go on the left hand side there, um, near where that sort of stanchion is or floodlight is behind, uh, shown there, and. Well, the government highways are concerned it would, would be a distraction, being especially a digital display that would change quite regularly. Um, uh, and this is a fast stretch of road, really, isn't it? Uh, as you come come down to the roundabout, move off the roundabout, felt it would be an unacceptable distraction to road users and and, uh, uh, and a danger. And therefore, it was uh, they um, recommended it was refused. We did refuse on that basis, and the inspector uh, agreed and said that it would be an unacceptable distraction to highways. Safety, so it was dismissed at appeal. In a nutshell. Okay, um, that's the end of the agenda. So thanks very much, everybody. We'll uh, see you next time. Thank you, Chair.